preached uh, through Bible study. We've preached through prayer. We've talked about, about worship. Um, and now we're going to uh, lead in and prepare to talk about service. Uh, the last thing we'll talk about um, as we get ready for Dave Ramsey starting in August is stewardship and how to be better managers and uh, stewards over the resources that God has entrusted to us. So with regard to our finances, our investment, our salary, paying our debt down, um, becoming debt free is, is the goal. Um, having an emergency fund, having a budget. Most families operate financially and they don't have a budget. Dave's going to talk to us about that and show us how to do that. So all of the nuts and bolts about finances is coming up um, in August as we get ready for, uh, for stewardship. But we want to talk about service, service to God through serving his people. But tonight I want to focus on worshiping God um, through service. And so the text that we're going to look at that Dr. Sproul uh, touches on um, in the chapter um, is dealing with this, this um, historical text in Joshua. Why don't we pray and then we'll look at this account uh, in Joshua. Lord, settle our hearts now and, and speak to us as we need to hear from heaven today as we give ourselves away through this uh, medium of service. Uh, bless us now as we talk about uh, how we are to serve you. And so speak to us in Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. You know, how do we, how do we get to the place where we can serve God when there are so many things and so many people that are clamoring for our attention? You know, God is always the first one to get pushed off to the side or to get left out when things get hectic in our life. And Joshua brings the people of Israel. He's the one that leads them into the promised land. And as he is, has led them into the promised land and as they are settling into the land that God swore to give them, he reminds them that as they begin their new lives in a new place. He reminds them to renew the covenant that God had made with them, and he reminds them to serve the Lord. And that's what we want to talk about. There are so many things going on in our lives, so many things that we're called to, so many things that, that we're responsible for, and if we're not careful... God can get left out of the equation. And so I think that there's a correlation between what the people of Israel were preparing for in their new lives and what we might be confronted with, with the hectic um, uh, uh, responsibilities and the, the duties that we have before us. So I want to look at this, this uh, issue. But before we look at the preaching text, there's a wonderful passage um, in, in Joshua 21, verses 43 through 45, that's coming up on the screen that I just uh, want to look at in your, in your presence. Look at what Joshua reminds the people of in this particular uh, account, this historical account of Joshua. Look at Joshua 21, 43 through 45. Joshua says, So the Lord... The Lord gave Israel all the land he had sworn to give their fathers. And they took possession of it and settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all he had sworn to their fathers. And none of their enemies were able to stand against them for the Lord handed over all their enemies to them. And none of the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. Everything was fulfilled. God's covenant faithfulness deserves a response. God had given them the land that he had sworn to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God had given them rest on all their sides. God had, God had caused them to conquer and win the battles. God was in the midst of them, and he was making a way for them. Look at chapter 24. This is not coming up on the screen. you got to read along with me. Look at chapter 4. I want to give you the background. God's faithfulness deserves a response from his people. 
In chapter 24, look at this account as I read through it. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so it might read a little different than what you have. But look at what Joshua's account says. And Joshua assembled all the people, all the tribes of Israel at Shechem and summoned Israel's elders and leaders and judges and officers and they presented themselves before God. And look at what Joshua says to the people in verse 2. And Joshua said to them, this is what the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the region beyond the Euphrates River and led him through throughout the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. And to Isaac I gave Jacob uh, and Esau and I gave the hill country of Seir to Esau as a possession. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did there. And afterwards, I, I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you reached the Red Sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen as far as the sea. And your fathers cried out to the Lord, so he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea over them and engulfed them. And your own eyes saw what I did to Egypt. After that, you lived in the wilderness a long time. Later, I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan. And they fought against you, but I handed them over to you. You possessed their land, and I annihilated them before you. Belak and Zippor, the king of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. And he sent for Balaam the son of Beor, to curse you. But I did not listen to Balaam. Instead, he repeatedly blessed you, and I delivered you from his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the people of Jericho, as well as the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites and the Mighty Mites. Well, that's not in the text, right? But there's just a lot of ites in Cana, right? So all of these ites fought against you, but I handed them over to you. But I sent the hornets ahead of you, and it drove out the two Amorite kings before you. And look at what God says. I love this. He says, it was not by your sword or bow, but I gave you a land you did not labor for and cities you did not build though you live in them. And you are eating from vineyards and from olive groves, which you did not plant. Now the question begs asking, God's covenant faithfulness, the faithfulness that God had demonstrated from Abraham up to now Joshua, as the people have now settled into the land that he promised that he would give Abraham hundreds of years ago. God's Faithfulness deserves a response. So the first word in verse 14 of our preaching text is what? Is therefore. Now, whenever we come to therefore in the biblical text, we should always ask the question, what is therefore, therefore? Therefore, is there to point us back to what Joshua had just said. He's reminding them of God's covenant faithfulness, and it deserves a response. God's covenant faithfulness deserves a response, and the response that it deserves is that we should serve him as an act of worship. In response to God's goodness, in response to his faithfulness, God's covenant people should serve and worship him. And I want to I begin to look at this particular text. Look at verse 14. He says, therefore, in light of all that God has done, Joshua commands the people, and there are three imperatives in this particular text. There are actually four, but one of them is repeated. The first imperative, the first command that he gives to the people is to fear the Lord. Not fear as we cower before him, but this is a, a reverence, an honor, a, a, a reverence of respect for God. 
The first thing we need to do is respect God, and the second one is to worship him. Worship is not optional. It's not something we can get to when our schedule opens up. God says to worship him, or your Bible might say to serve him. He says, and we do it with sincerity and with truth. God doesn't accept strange fire, and he doesn't accept hypocritical worship. He doesn't accept half-hearted uh, praise. He wants our worship and our service to be sincere based upon the truth of, what, of who we know God to be. And then I love the third imperative. The third imperative, Joshua says to get rid of the gods of your ancestors who worship beyond the Euphrates River and, and in Egypt. And then the fourth imperative is redundant. He says to worship or serve the Lord. Now, it's interesting that Joshua tells the people to get rid of the gods that are among them. It's interesting because we have gods that we serve as well. Who are the gods that the Israelites serve? The first thing we need to come to grips with is that there are other gods that are vying for our attention. That's why it's so hard to to focus and to serve the Lord. There are so many other things, so many other people that are vying for our attention, but who were the gods that the Israelites served? The first god that they served is Baal, and we see this in Joshua, in Judges chapter 2. Turn over a couple of chapters to Judges. I want to show this to you. Judges chapter 2. We're in Joshua 24. Judges is the next book to your right. And look at chapter 2. Now, the people had professed in Joshua 24 that they would serve the Lord. Obviously, that didn't happen. Look at what uh, Judges 2 says, beginning at verse 11. It says, And the Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went after other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They infuriated the Lord, for they abandoned him and worshiped Baal and Ashtoreth. Well, who are these two gods? Baal uh, was the chief god of the Canaanite pantheon. He was the chief god, and he was a god of weather. He was associated with thunderstorms, and he was the god of agricultural fertility. The people worshiped Baal because in the, the desert region of Cana, you need rain in order to grow crops and to farm. And so they prayed to the weather god, Baal, to make sure that they had enough, enough uh, irrigation in the land in order to sustain their crops. Baal worship is prevalent throughout Israel's history. But then they also worship this goddess, this female god named Asherah. And she was a goddess of love and sensuality. She was the goddess of fertility, but her fertility was reproductive fertility. If you were, were barren, if you were having problems uh, producing children, you, you prayed and worshiped and served the goddess Asherah and prayed to her so that she might give you the child that you desired. And it's interesting that the people of Israel bow down and serve Baal and Ashtoreth. Now, what's critical in Joshua 24 is they say, they say clearly that they're going to serve the Lord. Now, here's one of the things we always do, and I'm going to put this back on us. Whenever we read about these cryptic texts where the people are doing awful things in God's presence, we say to ourselves, like when we go to Exodus chapter 32 and the people build the golden calf and say, this is the God that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we're always taken aback by Israel's shallowness. We're always scratching our heads as to how jaded and jacked up these people are that they see these wonderful miracles and these awesome events and these wonderful things that God is doing in their midst and they turn around the first opportunity to get and they start 
worshiping and serving other gods. And we say to ourselves, what is wrong with these people? And, what I, and, I, and I say this all the time, whenever we, come across, whenever we come across texts that disturb us and we say, how could these people, the number one thing we should stop and say, wait a second, Pastor Darrell says we should say to ourselves, how could I? Because it's not how could they, it's because we're just like them. So the question we have to ask is, we see the gods that they serve, but who are the gods that we serve? See, that's the question I want you to get at. That's, see, we don't, we're just not to be appalled and disgusted by the Israelites' behavior. Who are the gods that, that we serve? That's the fundamental, fundamental question that we want to ask ourselves. The gods that we serve are our occupation. Some of us worship our jobs. Some of us uh, are totally wrapped up in our jobs. And the only thing we can do is work, 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 work. There's no time for God. It's only about our job. And trying to get the next raise and trying to move up that corporate ladder and trying to do what we can to get our bonus. Now, I'm not against hard work, but some of us are working to the degree that we don't have time to worship and serve God, and our job becomes our God. And then some of us are worshiping a relationship. Some of us are so wrapped up in the him or in the her or into a spouse that we cannot serve and worship God because our relationship means the world to us and it requires all of our attention. Some of us can't get out from under our spouses to obey God and to serve him. Some of us are even wrapped up in our children. Our children have such busy schedules and they're, and they're involved in this and that and the other and they're, we're, we have them over engaged and over committed to things that they can't serve God and neither can we. Some of us are worshiping the God of Facebook. Some of us spend more time on Facebook. The average, uh, the normal Facebook person uh, spends dozens of hours on Facebook during the course of the week. So while we're liking things and Reading what's going on on our friends' pages, that's time spent with God and prayer and devotion that we can't give because we're worshiping the God of Facebook. And some of us worship the God of our TiVo, you know, our DVR. We've got all of our shows lined up. And, and I worship that God this week. I was up to 3 o'clock one morning watching uh, Undercover Boss. I don't know if anybody else watches that, but that's one of my shows. And I had about five or six stored up in the TiVo, and I hadn't had a chance to watch them. But now that school is over and I finally got a chance to breathe, I said, you know what, I should get caught up on Undercover Boss. You think pastors don't have problems with that? Some of you can't serve because we're sitting in front of the TV. Some of us can't get out of the malls. So shopping becomes our God, and we're, we're always in the stores, running up our credit cards and buying things we can't afford because we have an itch to, to shop. And even when we don't have any money or have any intentions of buying anything, we just like to go window shopping. That's devotion, time with prayer, time in Bible study, time discipling somebody, time having a conversation where we can exhort and encourage and stir, stir one another up and promote love and good works. Remember that last week from Hebrews 10? Shopping can get in the way of that. We all need to shop, but some of us are shopaholics. And then some of us can't serve God because we have substance abuse issues, our alcohol and our drugs, uh, and pursuing those things and being, and being high doesn't allow us to serve God because we're serving the substance. Some of us are addicted to porn and are watching things that are inappropriate on TV, and so therefore... Serving God is the furthest thing from our mind. I was teasing Osue because the last one, him and his stepfather have a problem with, and that's playing video games. Josue and I had a good chuckle about that because some of us spend hours and hours and hours playing the video games, and we can't seem to find time to serve God. 
So it's easy for us to look at the Israelites and say, how could they worship Baal and Asherah when we have gods that we serve? Some of us are just lazy and don't want to serve God and can't do any better than what we're doing. And Joshua tells the people in verse 14, he says, get rid of the other gods. Respect God and serve him. That's a command. We've got to find the proper balance in our life where where you can watch TV, where you can shop, where, where you can be on Facebook. But you, God still has his proper place and he still has his priority. And some of us have never strike that balance. Our lives are out of whack. They're out of balance. And whenever God is on the back burner, whenever he does not have the forthright place in our life, we can never get to the place where we can be conformed to the image of Christ and be blessed the way God wants us to when we've put him on the back burner. So Joshua is reminding these people as they go into their new lives, as they establish their lives in new cities, as they they build new homes and as they, they start their new life, he says, don't forget God and get rid of these other gods. He must be our priority. And my my message to you is that God, too, must be our priority. Even in our busyness and even through our commitment, God must be our priority. Not only that, not only must we be aware of there being other gods that are vying uh, for our attention, but we also must understand that that fidelity to God requires a voluntary choice. So Joshua says for them, to choose for yourselves. Look at verse 15 again with me. Joshua, look at what he says in verse 15 of Joshua 24. He says, but if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, if it, if it seems evil to you, your Bible might say, if, it, if you don't want to worship or serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today who you will worship. See, service to God, worship through service requires a voluntary choice. We've got to choose to worship God. We don't fall out of the bed serving God. It's got to become, we've got to do it with intentionality. It's got to be something that we intentionally do, that we're focused on, that we make an intentional choice. Lord, this is the part of my week that I'm going to give to serving you. Now, some of us think, well, you know, I come to Victory on Saturday nights and I give an hour and a half or two hours of my time. Well, that's generous of you. Think about it. There are 168 hours in the week. There are seven 24-hour days. When you think about 168 hours in the course of a seven-day week, If you think you've done God a service because you show up on two hours on Saturday to give him your time, then then you've got another thing coming. That's pure nonsense. That's not even a tenth of our week. Think about it. If we just gave God a tithe of our time, that would be 16 hours, right? So what are we giving him when we show up on Saturday and think we can go home feeling like a champion? It's nothing. God wants us to serve him all week long, not just what we do here. Well, how do I serve him when the church is only open a couple of days? You serve him by being a good employee at work, working hard and being faithful to your your company or to whatever your business enterprise is. That's worship through service. If you're married, serving your husband or serving your wife, is pleasing to the Lord, and that counts for service. Doing things for your children counts as service. Meeting somebody's need, uh, a friend calls you who's in need, that's service. God wants us to be available, but so many of us are unavailable. We screen all of our calls. We don't want to be interrupted. We want to be left alone. But God has called us to serve him through serving one another. And Joshua says, look, folks, if if you guys don't think this is a good idea, choose who you're going to serve. He says, you can serve the gods that 
that Abraham served and his father served on the other side of the Euphrates River uh, before God called them into Cana. You guys can serve those gods. You guys can serve the gods uh, of the Amorites and whose land in which you, which you now dwell. But serving God requires a choice. Fidelity to God requires a voluntary choice. It doesn't fall out of the sky and it doesn't happen by osmosis. You've got to make a concerted effort to choose to serve and worship the Lord. So the first two things, there are gods that are vying for our attention and for our affection. And then the other thing is serving God requires a choice. And then the last thing Joshua says that as you make your choice, everybody has the freedom to make that choice. But I love what Joshua says. The third thing Joshua says is that as for me and my family, we've already decided that we're going to serve the Lord. And so it's critical for us to, to, to say for each individual family. Joshua says, your Bible might say, as for me and my house or for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And I'm saying to you, I don't know what, you guys are going to do. I don't know if you're going to continue to worship your gods, but as I'm responsible for me and my family, we are going to serve the Lord. And my hope and my prayer is that as we talk for the next few weeks about service, is that you would come to grips with this reality. The reality is simply this. God's faithfulness, the way he had bless these people. Joshua's rationale is, is that because God has been faithful to our forefathers and to us and has brought us to the land that he swore to give us, our response should be, we should serve the Lord and serve him only. And my challenge to you is that as you look back and as you consider and as you reflect on God's faithfulness and his goodness to you and to you and your family, that your response would be the same as Joshua, as Joshua's response. Lord, you've been good to me. And as a result of your goodness to me and my family, we're going to serve you. Not just right now, but we're going to serve you all the days of our life. That's what God wants from us. And as we trek through this series, we're going to be talking about service and giving ourselves away and making ourselves available for God to use us. Because I don't know what kind of Christian it is that doesn't serve, that just wants service but doesn't want to serve. That's a foreign kind of faith. That is not the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And so my exhortation to you tonight is to think deeply about how good, is, how good God has been to you. Stop and reflect on how he's met your needs. Stop and, and, and be grateful for, for what God has done in the life of you and people that you know and that you care about that trust him by faith. And serve him. Make a commitment. Maybe you've never made a commitment to serve the Lord. Maybe you've kind of been in and out of service. Maybe you've broken some of your commitments. Maybe you were at a former church or, or in a different ministry. You were committed. You were plugged in. You were locked and loaded. You were serving the Lord. And then something happened. Life got in the way and, and all of a sudden you walked away from that commitment or that ministry fell apart and, and you've been trying to find your way back. Remember what Joshua said to these people. May this message, may this exhortation that, that, that Joshua has challenged the people with, this is his final message to these people. Joshua is old in life and he's come to the end of his life and he's given them a final exhortation. Now look with me at, at, verse, at chapter 24. One last thing. Look at the people's response at verse 16. I want their response to be our response. Now, their response isn't genuine, but I want ours to be genuine. Look at what they say in verse 16. It says, and the people replied, we will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. But we just saw in Judges 2 that didn't happen. But their affirmation is good. Their, their lip service is good. He says, for the Lord our God brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, the place of slavery, and performed these great signs before our eyes. And he also protected us all along the way we went 
and among all the peoples whose lands we travel through. The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will, will serve the Lord because he is our God. Now it's interesting what Joshua says in verse 19. And Joshua says, but Joshua told the people, you will not be able to serve the Lord because he is a holy God and he is a jealous God and he will not remove your transgressions and sins. If you abandon the Lord and worship foreign gods, he will turn against you and harm you and completely destroy you after he has been good to you. And the people say, no, no, no. In verse 21, the people answered to Joshua, we will worship, we will serve the Lord. And we just saw in Judges 2 that they did not. So let me ask you tonight, as you reaffirm your covenant to serve the Lord, to worship him, is it just lip service? As you're watching on YouTube, is your commitment to serve the Lord, as you're listening to the podcast, what is your commitment? Is your covenant, is your contract, is your agreement with God, is it solid or is it lip service like these people? We planted this church to give young people a place to come and to plug in and to serve the Lord and to worship him. I can't say that everyone has been faithful thus far. Some people have said, oh, I'm excited that Victory Christian Fellowship is launching. I'm excited about the work that God is doing. And if you look around, where are they? Because we, like those people, make commitments and we make agreements with God and then we walk away from them. Because other gods are tugging at our at our shirt sleeve and saying, I need your attention as well. So if we're going to ever be the church that God wants us to be, we've got to let our yes be yes and our no be no. What's our commitment tonight? Is it to serve the Lord with sincerity and with truth all the days of our life? Or are we on temporary assignment? Lord, I'm working temporary. I, don't, I can't be permanent. I'm not accepting a permanent job. I, I'm, just, I'm just a temp around here. What if God was temporary with his blessing? What if you woke up on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? But God is good 24-7. But we don't reciprocate our gratitude for his covenant faithfulness by serving him. So again, don't say about these people, how could they? Say, how could I? And so I want to pray. I want, I want us to make a commitment tonight. If you'd like to renew your commitment of service to God, if you want to stand in his holy house, this is, this is a place where he causes his name to dwell. And if you'd like to renew your commitment, if you want to say, God, I don't know what I've been doing, but I haven't been serving you. And John, I want to I want to reaffirm my commitment. I want to, and, and and if you've never made a commitment, maybe you want to make a commitment anew and say, Lord, I'm here at Victory Christian Fellowship, and I want to serve you. I want to use my talents, my gifts, my abilities, uh, my endowments, my capacities for your kingdom, for your glory, and for your honor. If you'd like to give God 110 percent of what you've got. Why don't we put our money where our mouth is and let's stand in his presence. If that's your prayer, if it's not, don't stand. We remember, we serve the Lord with sincerity and with truth. If you really want to make that commitment, this is between you and God. It's not about who's in the, who's in the house tonight, but this is about, it's about our commitment. It's about our fidelity, our faithfulness to God to give him 110%. And they'll get rid of the other gods and serve him with sincerity and truth. As we say to him, as for me and my house, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray as God is seeing us stand all over the house. Lord, we get this message from Joshua as 
for me and my family and me and my house. We will serve the Lord. We will respect and honor you. We will serve you with gladness. We will come before your presence with singing and enter your courts with praise. Lord, we want to serve you as we devote all of our life. We want to do it with sincerity and with truth. Lord, we want to get rid of the other gods, the little gods that are vying for our affection, that want our attention. There are things that are out there that may not inherently be bad, but they shouldn't become our priority. You are our priority. You are our Father. You are our God. And we want to commit our, our lives to serving you, to being available, to be what you want us to be, and having our schedules interrupted and be okay with that. Because we realize we're your vessels. We are your instruments. We are tools in your masterful hand. So, Lord, see our commitment. It's not just lip service like these people in in Joshua and in Judges. But, Lord, may our commitment be tried and true. You're worthy of our worship through service. So, Lord, we say tonight, As for me and my household, we will serve you, not just now, but for all of time and for all of eternity. So we thank you now for the privilege of renewing our commitment to you. In Jesus' name. Lord, that means something when we say, in Jesus' name. May we anchor our commitment tonight in the matchless magnificent and majestic name of our soon coming king, Jesus who is the Christ, the Messiah. And everyone said together, Amen. Amen.